Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Jean-Philippe uh, did his PhD uh, at Johns Hopkins University with Casper Hansen, uh, and that's actually where I, I met him. I did uh, my postdoc in, in the lab at that same time, and then moved to work in, at Genentech. And, and uh, JP is going to talk to us about uh, work for uh, analyzing CRISPR data. Uh, so take it away, uh, JP. Uh, thank you, Pete, for the introduction. Actually, um, it doesn't allow me to share my screen. No, the, it says the host disabled the, the, screen, the screen sharing. One second. I just want to say that uh, I didn't make it to the best friend forever slide of Aaron. We'll, we'll, have, we'll have to talk about that, Aaron, when you come back. <laughs> All right. I think you should be now co-host JP and should be able to share your screen. Perfect. That works. Thank you. Let me just be in for presentation. Okay. Uh, yep, very excited today to talk about the bioinformatics work that we do in the CRISPR space at Genentech. Uh, just a quick introduction for the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So the CRISPR-Cas9 system is, um, is composed of two components. There is a nuclease called the Cas9, and the, the, the role of the nuclease is to go cut the DNA. And there is a GAD RNA, which is here, uh, this uh, little uh, sequence at, at the bottom which is complementary to a region in the target DNA. And that GAD RNA is going to uh, fuse with the nuclease and it's going to guide the nuclease to a specific location. Once the two together come uh, at, that, at the target location, it's introducing a double strand break. And then the cell machinery is going to repair the DNA break and that's going to introduce an indel in the DNA. And hopefully you hope that this NDL is going to uh, create a functional knockout. So that's the principle behind the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And there's many ways we've been using CRISPR, uh, Genentech, and one of the type of experiments that we do is what we call a functional pool screen. So the idea here is uh, we design GAD RNAs that target different genes in the genome, and we package those GAD RNAs into lentivirus. And uh, so each lentiviral component has one GAD RNA. And we start with a set of cells that are expressing Cas9, so the nuclease. So those cells were engineered to have endogenous Cas9 expressed. And then we infect those cells with the lentiviral library with an, an infection rate that is low enough that each cell will only get one GAD RNA. And then we apply some uh, selection on those cells. So you can you can also let the cells just grow, and and see what happens to the cells. So here you see that some cells disappear, and by doing some uh, sequencing of the GAD RNAs in those cells, we can see uh, we we can uh, we can uh, basically link the phenotype to the genomic perturbation. So what we do is at the beginning of the experiment when the editing is not happening yet. We do some sequencing. So this is basically GAD RNA counts at the beginning. Then after some cell culture or some selection, we are again going to count the GAD RNAs in the experiment. And then by looking at the difference between uh, the, the latest time point and the early time point, we can calculate the log full change. And then we can, uh, by looking at the log full change, we can uh, investigate the, the effect of the genomic perturbation in the cells. So for instance, GAD RNAs that are targeting essential genes for survival of the cells are going to deplete in the final population of cells because the knockout is creating, uh, is, is making the cells die. So, and to support those kind of experiments, we've been developing uh, different types of pipelines and, uh, Today, I'm going to talk about the very first step of the pipeline, which is designing those GAD RNAs. So for a given gene, we have multiple choices to design a GAD RNA. So the question is, which GAD RNA should you design to have an optimal experiment? So today, I'm going to talk about this first part. And this is the part that we open sourced. The rest of the pipeline is not open source yet. And one of the challenges in designing those GAD RNAs is CRISPR-Cas9 is only one type of CRISPR technologies that are available right now. Uh, since the, its origin, there has been a lot of uh, different expansions of the technology. So there's uh, CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A, which are respectively uh, um, 
inhibiting expression and activating expression. So it's not doing a cut, but it's basically regulating the expression of the gene. And then we have also CRISPR-based editing, which is instead of cutting, in this case, it's going to do uh, a base mutation, uh, depending on the base editor that is fused to the nuclease. And then we have also uh, the latest technology is this CRISPR RNA uh, interference, which is in, instead of having a DNA targeting nuclease here, we have an RNA targeting nuclease, so you can target RNAs. And Cas9 is one of the nucleases, but we've also started to extend uh, the technology to other nucleases uh, internally. So we use a Cas12a and, and one of the RNA targeting nucleases is a Cas13d. And when we uh, started designing GAT RNAs, we were trying to use uh, publicly available software and other bioconductor packages. And we realized very quickly that uh, there were a lot of features that were not available in those software. And here's a table where um, the rows of the different features that we needed for experiments and the columns of the different software. And you can see that there's a lot of gap in the table. So uh, that's why we started developing our own software and our own, own ecosystem of packages to, de to design those GAD RNAs. And after a few years of uh, refactoring our code, we uh, started developing a more consistent ecosystem of our packages that we call the CRISPRverse. And the CRISPRverse now is a series of our packages all uh, published in Bioconductor, and it's a modular ecosystem. So each of the components or each of the R packages is doing a very specific uh, task in the GAD RNA design. For instance, there's CRISPR bow tie, CRISPR BW BWA, which by the name you can guess are doing some uh, type of bow tie and BWA alignment of GAD RNA sequences. Uh, and then we have other packages that are more specialized that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So the idea behind the CRISPRverse is we start with a region of the genome. Uh, in this case, in this example, I'm using the Keras uh, gene in the human genome. And uh, this, the CRISPRverse allow you to specify a specific nuclease, in this case, um, the Cas9 nuclease. And the first step is to create a genomic ranges object of the target sequences of the GAD RNAs. And once we have this core genomic ranges, what we do is we create uh, functionalities to add to the metadata columns of these genomic ranges. And this whole object is what we call a guide set, which is basically an extended class uh, of the genomic ranges. So the first thing we do is we add some annotations about the spacer sequences. So we add some annotations for the restriction enzymes, which, which is important when you do uh, cloning of the GAD RNAs, but also we try to keep up with the literature to add um, sequence features that have been uh, that have been discovered to be toxic in some context for the cells. So we make sure we add those annotations to the object. We also add SNP annotations. So we want to make sure that the GAD RNAs are not overlapping common SNPs to make sure that we have optimal binding of the nuclease to the genome. And then we developed those two packages, CRISPR bowtie, BWA, which is basically wrappers of bowtie and BWA that allows to do an off-target uh, alignment of the GAD RNA sequences. So for the Cas9 nuclease, there's um, if the spacer sequence has uh, mismatches to other locations in the genome, uh, the nuclease can be tolerant to that. So and you might think that you're cutting at a specific location, but because of the off target, you might also be cutting at other places. So we make sure that we provide to the user rich annotations to tell them what are the possible off targets and are those off targets located in other genes so that uh, if they realize that a given GAD RNA is cutting in uh, another gene, they can just decide to not use that GAD RNA. And one other thing that we do is we provide really rich annotations uh, with respect to the genomic context and TSS annotation. So for each GAD RNA, we provide a table of all the isoforms in the ensemble annotation that are targeted. We also um, add um, the PFEM domain annotation and also where is the GAD RNA with respect to the CDES start. So because it's known that uh, targeting the first 85% of the CDES 
uh, leads to more optimal knockout. So we want to make sure the user know that. Oops. And finally, a very extensive um, annotation is what we call the, the scores annotation. So it's a way to uh, select the best GATT RNA. So we provide a series of scores based on chromatin accessibility, um, evolutionary conservation, but also a score for predicted on target activity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that with the CRISPR score package. So uh, there are some GATT RNAs for some reason are not really good at cutting. So there's been a series of prediction algorithms that uh, using deep learning and using the sequence feature of the spacer sequence and also the flanking sequence around those spacer sequence, uh, they're trying to predict uh, if a GAD RNA is going to be good at cutting. But one of the challenges is the those algorithms have been written by different academic labs in, in uh, Python 2, Python 3, and R. And some of those algorithms are not really maintained. It's just uh, GitHub code that has been published during the paper, but was not maintained after that. So that was quite a challenge for us to be able to incorporate those cores into our, our ecosystem. But at the same time, the nice thing about being in the same office than Aaron is that Aaron was de developing Basilisk, uh, which is an R package, which can, can basically uh, allow users to use different Python environments in the same R session. And you can also use Python 2 and Python 3 in the same R session. So it's built on top of Reticulate, but it allows you to um, use different Python environments. So you can talk about, you can talk more about this with Aaron. Uh, so build on that, we created CRISPR score, which is basically a way to um, get all those scores from those uh, Python environments, and at the end of the day, we get this nice table of all the summarized scores and that the, can, the, the user can consume. And once we have all of those rich annotations, the goal um, of uh, having those annotations is to be able to select the best guide RNAs for a given experiment. So we provide uh, different ranking algorithms based on, on target specificity, the spacer composition, the target lo localization, and also on some uh, ranking based on the functional annotations. And uh, we did some benchmarking on this. Uh, and to do that, we look at um, a large dropout screen, which is basically just cells that are grown in culture. And then by looking at a reference set of essential genes, we can look at GAD RNAs uh, in targeting those essential genes. And you expect that a good GAD RNA should drop out in the screen because it's targeting the central gene and the cells is dying. So you should see a, a negative log full change. And what we did is we look at our best 15 top ranked GAD RNAs for each gene. And this is what I show here in red. And the green is all the remaining GAD RNAs. And you can see that the ones that are top ranked show a more negative log full change, meaning that they, they're more active. And we quantified that by using a delta log full change. And then we repeated that on five data sets with independent GAD RNA libraries. And we compared to um, four other algorithms that are publicly available and that also offer ranking. So here, a greater delta log full change indicates that the ranking uh, is yielding more optimal GAD RNAs. And the conclusion here is that CRISPR design is doing really well at uh, picking good GAD RNAs compared to the other softwares. Um, all of the packages are in Backconductor, as I said, but we also have a CRISPRverse a GitHub organization where we consolidate all of those packages and also provide uh, tutorials, uh, a, a long list of tutorials to be able to design your own GAD RNA libraries in different uh, contexts and different modalities. And also, uh, we, our work just got uh, published recently, a couple of weeks ago, in uh, Nature Communication. So you can go uh, take a look at it and read more about our work. And on this, I want to thank all of my colleagues in bioinformatics, uh, also my colleagues in the function, functional genomics labs in the molecular biology department, 
but also all of the bioconductor community and in particular uh, the five bioconductor reviewers who've been really helping um, improving our packages and accepting our packages into bioconductor. All right, thank you. On this, I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you, JP. Uh, I hope you heard the applause there. There was applause in the room. Uh, questions from the room? JP, thank you for the talk. That was excellent. I'm um, just wanting to know whether if your package can uh, do the reverse. So once you design your library, you've gone ahead and done the screen, you came up with the targets that you think is enriched in your guides. But as you indicated, there's always off target effects. And there's mm -hmm. never really been talked about what the possibility of off target effect is. Because a lot of these experiments say if you have 10 guides, some you know, five out of 10 might not be as good and that's the best that you can do. And then the results are enriched, but you don't, let's say you don't validate your target. Is that because, is there a way to pull out sort of what the other five targets are showing a off target and what might be off target B? Cause you're thinking you're hitting gene A, but actually because of your off target, that guy actually represent target B for instance. Yeah, we often do that when we have hits and we are a bit suspicious of the guide because it's either targeting, say, an olfactory receptor or something else. We then um, go back, annotate this guide RNA and look at all the putative of targets. And, and often we find that it, it's indeed targeting another gene that is also a hit in the screen, but uh, was, you know, so, so we can confirm that that guide had enough target to the other hit. Uh, we yeah. do a lot of that where we, yes, yes. that's able to do that. Uh, so you can technically, yeah, you can take a look, you can take a list of guide RNAs from an experiment and you can kind of go back and annotate them. Yeah. Uh, is that the question? Yes, that's right. Thanks. Yeah. We often do that also with external libraries. We get external libraries and we want to make sure they're good quality and we just, fully annotate them with a crisp reverse. Fantastic. Thank you, JP. Thank you for joining us. I hope you can uh, enjoy some of the rest of the conference online and hope Thanks. to see you in person again soon. So please join me in thanking JP for his talk. Mm -hmm.